OK, so um, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to talk today. Um, some of you may have seen some elements of uh, of this presentation at the previous uh, global review that we did. But actually, over the last few months, um, we've really looked back at um, the previous two years and uh, and drawn some conclusions, I think, about permanent changes um, to the semiconductor market. You know, people are talking about whether or not the um, the lead times will go back to normal, supply will go back to normal. I think in, in many cases, um, the things have changed and they will never go back to the way they were in, in, in a number of cases. So let me um, let me point out where I uh, why, why we've drawn these conclusions. Um, so. Yes, lead times are improving slowly. There are still shortages almost everywhere. Um, most of the lead time reporting that we see through the distribution network and from the manufacturers hasn't yet shown reducing lead times in a major way. Certain product lines are easing, um, certain products are easing, but quite honestly, we're not seeing any broad uh, improvement yet. Uh, predictions are that it will still run into 2023. Exactly when it depends, but uh, so I, I mean I'm I'm hedging my bets because I basically uh, I'm not getting a clear answer on that. But what it, what the clear um, evidence is that we're seeing is that um, the supply chain is now more delicate and more susceptible to. Um, changes than than ever before. I think people uh, over the last few years have got into um, um, a, a, an understanding that people promise a lead time and the product del is delivered, shipments are there, um, it comes through the door as and when. Um, I think those days for the most part are over. And if we look at some of the global um, changes and controls that uh, are going on uh, on the market from nations um, i think we are in a position where there will always be now a doubt as to whether or not a promise given is actually going to be uh, delivered um, so i'm saying that the word uh, that um, certainty is now more uncertain than ever and uh, under those uh, under those circumstances we, I think customers need to be looking at second sourcing. Now, obviously, you're going to source uh, your the volume of your parts from lowest cost, uh, standard distribution, the high volume people that are out there. But um, increasingly, we're looking uh, or customers are looking to have that fallback, instant fallback position. Um, the DigiKeys and Mauser of this world have supported uh, low volume instant supply for for years. Um, there are other people, including ourselves, that can also offer that sort of service. But you need to know where you can pull uh, when uh, your delivery doesn't come through the door. And we're actually seeing, by the way, um, some of our big contract manufacturers take our stock profile and load it into their database so that it's visible to every purchaser's screen um, and they can then see that there's a quantity of stock available um, at, at the drop of a hat. So those things and that API link is starting to open now for a number of uh, customers who, who talk to us. Um, I suppose the, the, the biggest uh, issue that we've seen as a permanent change is premature discontinuations. Um, I think there's been a lot of talk over the years about uh, semiconductor life cycles shortening. And for anybody that's in the industrial or any any product in any market that has a reasonably long design qualification cycle, production cycle, and particularly in service cycle, that a shortening um, semiconductor life cycle 
is a major issue for them because there is less time that it's going to be around. You're going to have to make more commitments early in order to satisfy an uncertain tale. And, you know, we're, we're seeing now uh, this coming as a result of a number of different factors. Um, what, sorry, one other thing here is that a small number of markets and applications are now dictating the end of life. So I will give you an example. Automotive customers, maybe two or three years ago, never felt that they were going to be subject to the market shortages, et cetera, that are out there. Um, I think the last two years has shocked them. And now most realize that fab closures, fab, fab capacity, et cetera, is their volume still don't make it to determine the decision to start and stop. So there are a few markets, I think, which control it and probably no one in the industrial market and maybe only one of uh, a few in the automotive market can control uh, the end of life of the major fabs and the technologies that are out there. Let me give you some examples. In the last 24 months, we've seen third party fabs and there are an awful lot of fabless semiconductor companies out there. They use third party fabs because they don't invest then themselves. They haven't got the huge capital costs and they piggyback those technologies. They design around them and then they yet then use that capacity. What that effectively means, though, is that they are no longer in control of their own manufacturing process. And we've seen, well, 10, 12 different uh, instances where the semiconductor company themselves have been surprised by a third party decision to stop that a particular technology. And in one case recently um, related to an IBM fab, uh, the end of life was one month long. <laughs> the PDN ar arrived on the 29th of July and last time by date was uh, the end of August. So for anybody on holiday, um, uh, I think you were pretty much scuppered. So, you know, we're seeing more and more of those. And basically, uh, the original chip manufacturer isn't always in control of when those fab processes come and go. Interestingly, we're also seeing third party assembly houses now looking to prune certain packages. Um, they've got too much product for the capacity that they've got. They probably don't want to be building small SOICs that get them a few tenths of uh, a few, few tenths of a dollar, 10 cents or whatever. They would much prefer to, to be building products that are um, high dollar value. And so they are taking the opportunity now to prune their own. And I think uh, from a packaging point of view, uh, the ones that I've picked out there are also interesting because lead frame, um, lead times and costs have gone crazy. Um, it's been one of the major problems and probably one of the reasons hidden behind many of the lead time issues that we've seen. We've still got manufacturers out there, uh, uh, semiconductor manufacturers, who cannot commit a delivery date on small SOICs. They're not end of life, they're just, there's no commitment to manufacture them. So ultimately they will have to take that decision and decide whether they're going to continue with it or not. So I think, well, I definitely see um, certain package styles going much quicker from the market than perhaps we've, we've seen before. Uh, Final, another one here, tester platforms. Um, again, they are not, an, they're not supported in the market on an infinite basis. Um, it's not always economical for the Teradynes of this world to continue to support spare parts and, and uh, software support. So again, some of the reasons behind the PDN can be tester related as well. And of course, we've got assembly tool and warehouse wear out and when when you're talking of half a million dollars to replace a lead frame tool you have to have an awful lot of justification um, to do that 
And of course, there's the ever present risk of uh, fires and natural disasters, but that goes without saying. And those things appear regardless of what an algorithm um, in your life cycle tool will tell you. It'll it'll just appear and one one day you will have capacity and the next day you won't have anything at all. So um, how do you protect yourself against those changes? Um, and I've, I've mentioned this before, I'm becoming a bit of a broken record, I think, but uh, we can only help, or rather there is only a chance to help in a very small window here. Um, we need the support, because we're authorised, we need the support of the original manufacturer. And many times um, they don't want to make a product end of life. The wafer may still be available for other packages. Let's let's take the um, uh, the package issue. Uh, the wafer may still be available and uh, able to support a number of packages which are not subject to end of life. But imagine the PLCC, the SOIC, the small one that's in there. They ultimately are forced to make that end of life. If we are notified that you're a user, if if we are notified that the market potential is out there, Rochester is prepared to invest and has the relationships with the original chip manufacturer in order to extract the data so that we can then make that transition as seamless as possible. Our goal is to try and turn the discontinuation into a PCN. Um, that's a grand statement and it demands an awful lot of cooperation and to be in the right place at the right time. But really, we can't do that without customers telling us that they're affected, that this is a major issue for them. And then on like any economic um, decision, we have to decide whether the investment we're making is justified, etc. By the way, I cannot help if there is a formal last time buy process here. I cannot help customers avoid that. Um, the original chip manufacturers, if they have a normal PDN process, et cetera, um, Rochester's involvement at that point may not always be welcomed by them. But uh, we have good relationships with them. The worst thing, the worst that could happen is they tell us to get lost. Uh, during that point, and we know that we you're no worse off than you were to start with. But if we miss that opportunity, then really, really, we have to struggle to try and recover that uh, um, much further down the line. So lots of things you can provide us, critical parts lists, weekly shortage lists. And in some cases, customers are sharing their full database with us as well. Um, we can work through tens of thousands of codes and give you an indication of whether or not we have stock, whether we have wafer, um, et cetera. And then that provides us a database when we look at PDNs to say, well, actually, this customer's a user, and, it, and that way we can proactively come and talk to you as the PDNs announced, hopefully. So we're really, I suppose, a summary is we're trying to reduce the risk for you. Um, so why do you share critical parts lists with us? In summary, uh, we provide an instant solution in times of crisis. So shortages, sudden lead time changes, a fire at a factory. Um, we had an instance uh, well, two or three years ago now where a fire uh, in Japan at a factory was announced and within 48 hours we'd identified the six million pieces of stock that we had for those codes and then we're triggering the proactive calls to the customers to say well actually you may not be aware but this has happened we have this stock be the first in line to try and and get it i um i i really uh want to to have that uh, proactive uh level of support if we can make it um if you share critical parts list with us, typically we have over 50% of all the parts you would regard as obsolete um, still in stock or have uh, the ability to be able to build them. So we might be able to keep your 
um, in service maintenance and repair facility uh, going, allowing you to offer a longer service life for your in, in, in service parts, turn bids from no bids into bids. So for you. Um, your usage drives our end of life stock. So we actively go and look for the parts that we know have a market and that we know we have customers for. And we'll often make those decisions and those investments based on broad market data, a feel. It's not necessarily the case that we need to have it backed up with a PO at that point. We're investing money because we could see a broad opportunity. And uh, in, in many cases, we take that risk. And then your uh, usage drives our production plans and our developments. If we can capture wafer and all of the IP at the right time, then we can build for the long term as well. Um, if we just pick up end of life stock, we have what we have. And when it's gone, uh, we're no further forward. So our pre preference always is to try and get wafer and the test platforms to be able to offer those as a really long term solution. And we can avoid one redesign or one requalification for you. Um, I think it would be justified. That's I'm I'm not greedy. I I think um, that's all I'm looking for at the moment. And um, I, I think we we could then prove uh, a huge value. Just brief uh, overview of Rochester. You've seen this before, but 12 billion parts in stock. Um, by the way, interestingly, two things here we continue to get delivery of active parts on long lead times, even during allocation. And you will say, well, how did that happen? Well, people have date code restrictions. Those date codes still, even with a market that is um, desperate for parts, still sometimes mean that those parts end up getting um, pushed into a corner and then they end up uh, with Rochester. So, you know, we, we were getting parts in a um, whole range of automotive NXP semiconductors, for instance, um, nearly three million parts arrived last week. So it, it continues to happen. And many of those are on 52 week lead time and, and no stock in the market. So, yes, our, our stocks have shrunk. We've sold an awful lot, but um, we continue to receive uh, incoming product. Um, for production, uh, we have an awful lot of wafer available. Um, if we build a part, people say, what's the first thing they ask is, well, is it the same as the part that's from the original manufacturer? Yes, we have to be able to test it. We're authorized to build the identical part and therefore our part number is exactly the same as the original one that was on there. Everything stays within the authorized bubble, AS6496. The product never goes outside and we never go sourcing product in the open market. So really, we are a a fallback distributor, um, your emergency stop if you want for active semiconductors where there is a supply chain distribution um, problem, dis sorry, supply chain disruption problem. And then from the point, um, um, and particularly that, that window here around last time by when the PDN is announced, absolutely critical for us that we know that you're a user. But then from that point on, if we if we get that data and we've got a, a willing participant in the manufacturer themselves, we can then become the really long term manufacturer of those parts. Many of the things we still produce, by the way, um, were made end of life 20 years ago. So. Um, uh, product, uh, sorry, manufacturing line card um, continues to grow. Um, we had a pretty strong um, electronica. Um, so watch out for um, some changes and some additions to this uh, in the next few months. It doesn't mean that we have all products from all manufacturers, but we're trying 
to do that at the moment. Um, so we're trying to fill in gaps in product lines, for instance, where uh, perhaps their products haven't come to us. Uh, but many of these use Rochester as their only end of life and, uh, and shortage uh, support uh, partner. By the way, just a, an interesting point here, I will highlight Texas. Uh, TI have radically changed their distribution uh, model in the last few years. In fact, before that's been going on for a while. And there are now a very select group of uh, distributors worldwide, very limited number, who are still able to supply Texas Instruments products. I'm pleased to say that Rochester is still um, one of those. Um, but um, anyway, keep an eye open for, for these uh, for announcements actually in the next few months. So the challenge here is that Rochester is investing um, tens of millions of dollars in finished goods and wafer. Uh, that opportunity is temporary, very brief. Um, if we don't exploit it, if we don't uh, get to the right people and make the right deal, then product teams are broken up fabs are closed and the knowledge as well as the actual hardware tools etc uh, is just dispersed or scrapped um, so we have to grab that and only you can tell us where to to go and uh, and and spend our money um, yeah we'd like to be in a position where they they don't discontinue a product but they transfer the manufacturing to to rochester uh, we have had that in the past with Infineon um, on one particular uh, product line. We will, I'm sure in the next 12 months, get more of those because we're looking to uh, to step into the full manufacturing position. By the way, one, one thing here, we do not chain, make change for the sake of change. Um, if the fab is still available, obviously we'll use the fab that's there. But also if the assembly process is still available and third party assembly houses are happy to deal with Rochester, then we will pick that up as is. So sometimes there is no change at all to any of the process element. It's just that Rochester then takes over control where we make changes. There are PCNs in, in a normal way so that you can see uh, changes to that process or material or whatever it is um but we're we're not in the business of uh of of grabbing everything and taking it um in-house immediately we have our own in-house capability for packaging but we're also reliant on third party um houses all over the place because they have there's so much uh so many package styles to be able to cover we couldn't do it on our own um so we need you to tell us uh if we're purchasing the right type of wafer um nothing better than to be able to support uh a 10-year commitment and by by the way um we we buy wafer and we do uh look at um wafer reservations and long-term production um, commitments. So if you can see five years ahead, um, and we, we have wafer available off the shelf, uh, don't wait to the point where that wafer is disappearing. We're prepared to, to reserve that wafer, providing it's tied to a manufacturing commitment over a period, and we can support you then with a, with a, a, a long-term um, a production a run but that will require a commitment in terms of purchase order from you and really i suppose the the thing here is that we are trying to de-risk the supply chain by being proactive we're anticipating those problems or reacting instantly to anything that we see that's unforeseen allowing you to be the first to benefit from the stocks or manufacturing capabilities that we've got. Um, if you don't come and talk to us, 
typically there are some people that monitor the market extremely well um, that will fill that gap and they will purchase all of our our, our product um, from us and uh, we won't be able to help. So uh, I'm really after trying to support individual customers who share uh, that sort of level of data and trust with us. OK. And um, by the way, um, we will look at risk within the supply chain. If you give me a parts list, we won't just throw it against our database and say, actually, we have this part. We don't have this part. We look at alternatives. We look at the risk associated with the package, etc. And so you may get a level of understanding of risk, which may offer a slightly different angle or perhaps even a deeper angle um, than some of uh, the sort of standard algorithms that you see out there. But it is labor intensive, time consuming, and I'll do it for customers who um, are prepared to share the data, uh, not just everybody that comes through the door. Um, so one, I think you saw, uh, we may have seen this before, but there's one final case study really, which was on an old Intel part, transferred to us in 2006. Uh, Bosch had a part available um, for a while. Bosch then continued their uh, discontinued their product. It was a cut down version of the Intel CAN controller, and we then supported a uh, ventilator company or a medical company to rebuild an old ventilator design that they'd originally thought was was dead and buried simply because 52 weeks for their main processor on their on their latest one meant that they couldn't deliver anything to the market and i'm pleased to say they've reinstated that product because it's been the only thing that they've been able to sell over the last uh, two years so uh, that's it. If uh, you have any questions, uh, I would love to hear them. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah, very good. I think it, it's important that we have companies that continue to produce those things that normally are manufactured by the original manufacturer. So it's you know from the terminology of PCNs, it's it's still a kind of a PDN because it's a transfer to a new company, but anyhow, it's important. Yeah. Okay, any, any, any questions from the audience? I have a question. Um, when, when you said that you, like, like you just said, Wolfgang, that this transfer will happen, so you guys will take over production. Um, does IHS and Silicon Expert and all the others um, get informed about that? Because uh, I just want to know if this then would be not um, um, a discontinued information, but uh, uh, as a uh, transferred information. That's the one question. The other one is, if you still receive um, difficult to purchase parts, um, do you report these numbers also to these two databases, uh, Silicon Expert and so on, um, so they can uh, show them in their um, distributor section. And, and we can see that the parts are, st are there and available at Rochester. And I think you are listed there. Yes, um, thanks Joachim. Um, first question, uh, if the original manufacturer stops, then they'll be listed as an obsolete uh, as no longer yes. available to support it what happens then is rochester gets shown as an aftermarket manufacturer now we do share data um, to those databases um, i have a question about whether we do it with silicon expert or not but we do it with uh, uh, most of the others i think it's pretty we've we've done an awful lot of work over the last um year or two to try and clean our information to make sure that when we're when we're saying that we can manufacturing uh, manufacture something that we can actually do it and of course one piece of die can create perhaps 20 or 30 different part numbers so we, we've spent a lot of time uh cleaning that uh mm -hmm. but yes the, the the understanding of what that means is difficult because there aren't many people who do this sort of thing and people really genuinely can't believe that they're getting exactly the same product um, with exactly the same guarantees 
from someone who's not TI. Um, so that explanation is, is there. We are referenced as a separate category, if you want, aftermarket manufacturer. Um, we do our best to try and make sure that goes as far and uh, wide as possible. Uh, going on to the stock availability, yes, our stock is visible through uh, a number of different databases, including Octoparts and and um, many of the components databases. Again, I'm not sure about Silicon Expert, but that's updated on a daily basis. However, however, however okay. often they put um, that data through. What I would say, though, is we're aware we're aware of incoming packages that are available to bid on or that are coming to us sometimes as much as six months in advance so mm -hmm. please please don't think that that data that you're seeing there is the absolute only option um as i said we also put in um we can we can also perhaps suggest other alternatives faster products even even in desperation, leaded product uh, that we've still got in stock or an older die revision, whatever it is, you'll only get that sort of data from us at the moment by by talking okay. to us. So, and and we are working, by the way, on a on a cross referencing and an associates tool um, that we hope hope will be out in the next quarter, and then that should draw uh, much more well many more alternatives um, to your. I as you as you interrogate our system. OK. OK, thanks. Thanks for the question. So, OK, then I have a question. How do you deal with the obsolescence of raw materials? So I heard that, you know, uh, companies manufacturing some special kind of wafers are starting to discontinue them. So is this something that hits you as well? Yeah, absolutely. And if it affects the fab, there is very little that we can do. Um, I, I prefer to start at the other end and give you an example, perhaps where um, uh, the mold compound is no longer available um, and where we have to replace something within the manufacturing process such as that, we do fully requalify that product then through the um, uh, against the original test setups um, and offer it as a as a PCN so that people can see that it's fully qualified. If you go back to the raw materials uh, at a fab level, I would think that most of those will end up with us ending in a dead end. There, there is very little that we can do uh, around the fab in order to be able to to qualify that process. That's just one step removed from us. But assembly, the assembly part of it is something that we're in control of and can qualify and requalify if need be. Thanks a lot. So further questions? OK, so okay. then in this case, Ken, thanks a lot.